Gangster reputation caught up with him. The Israeli press began to take an interest in this Jewish relic of the Mafia world. To escape the press coverage, Lansky moved out of Tel Aviv to a resort hotel on the Mediterranean beach. But the cameras found him there too, just as they had in Miami, out walking his dog. So Lansky granted interviews to reporters in which he claimed he was a victim of media hype. The newspaper man started a campaign against me and it snowballed to such an extent that I guess it can't be stopped anymore. I was singled out for some reason. They needed an image. Some newspaper man wrote an article that I have $300 million. Well, I wish I had a million dollars. The controversy meant that Lansky's application for citizenship had to be reviewed by Israel's interior minister, Joseph Borg. Borg raised the touchy topic of Lansky one afternoon with his boss, Prime Minister Golda Meir. Golda Meir apparently had never heard of Meyer Lansky. As he started to explain who Lansky was or was thought to be, he said the word mafia, at which Golda Meir stopped him and said, mafia, mafia, no mafia in Israel. Israel turned down Lansky's application for citizenship, declaring him a threat to the state. Lansky immediately appealed to the Israeli Supreme Court. Israel needed evidence that Lansky was a threat, and the U.S., which now wanted Lansky back, was happy to help. The Justice Department gave Israel the complete Lansky files. They had first-hand testimony uh, from witnesses who had seen Lansky beat up somebody or participate in beating up people. Uh, uh, so they had a lot of stuff from the 20s and 30s, which, uh, uh, which had Lansky actually doing a bunch of things, uh, as opposed to, to uh, uh, just kind of walking his dog, uh, which is what he was doing in the 1970s. In September 1972, Israel's Supreme Court ruled against Lansky. Well, so long. He was ordered to leave the country. Not giving in, Lansky arranged to flee Israel in secret and to bribe officials to smuggle him into hiding in Paraguay. In November 72, Lansky quietly boarded a night flight that would take him to South America. As his jet crossed the Atlantic, the FBI tracked him down. When he arrived in Paraguay, he wasn't allowed to get off the plane. Every stop that the plane came down to, there was the FBI man standing on the tarmac with the local police chief, making sure that Lansky didn't get off, stayed on the plane, and was on his way back to, uh, inevitably therefore, to Miami and arrest where the FBI would let him off the plane and would surely lock him up. And finally, he shows up in Miami, and of course there's a big arrest, and uh, they can lead him away in handcuffs, and you know, that's the kind of thing the FBI loves. The government finally had a case against Meyer Lansky, and now it had Lansky himself. The aging mob tycoon would be forced to do battle with his own country in the courtroom. Meyer Lansky's attempted escape to Israel had been thwarted. On November 7th, 1972, he was returned to Miami, arrested after landing, and charged with contempt of court and income tax evasion. Lansky's wife, Teddy, arrived in Miami from Tel Aviv three days later. Unlike her stoic husband, Teddy Lansky had never gotten used to reporters. When the reporters wouldn't leave her alone, Teddy used a tactic her husband had never tried. She spat on them. The Justice Department was thrilled to have Lansky back in the U.S. For years, he had been a top FBI target, but Lansky had never been convicted of anything more serious than illegal gambling. Now the feds hoped they could put him behind bars for good. Lansky's first trial was for contempt of court. While in Israel, he had failed to show up when summoned to a Miami grand jury. Lansky claimed that his doctor in Israel had forbidden the trip home to testify, but the jury didn't buy it. Lansky was convicted and sentenced to a year in prison, but he remained free on appeal. He still had to stand trial for tax evasion. This case hinged on an unreliable informer, a Boston mobster named Vincent Fat Vinnie Teresa. Teresa told the feds that he had brought illegally skimmed profits from London casinos to mob investors in the States, and he assured his interrogators that on two occasions he had personally given thousands of dollars to Meyer Lansky. Well, this is the first guy anybody ever testified to putting big amounts of money in Lansky's hands, uh, literally in his hands. And so we were kind of excited about it and, and started to uh, develop a case. Mafia turncoats always make tricky witnesses, 
but Fat Vinny was the government's best shot at nailing Lansky. The trial began in July 1973. Teresa told the jury that he gave Lansky the mob money on two occasions, both in Miami. But Lansky's lawyer, David Rosen, was able to show that on one of those occasions, Lansky was in Boston. The little man himself, whose increasing frailty kept the trial sessions to a few hours a day, never testified. He looked like somebody's grandfather, anybody's grandfather. He looked very, very uh, harmless, uh, uh, and, and uh, he certainly didn't look like an organized crime character. Are you pleased with the way your attorneys handled your defense? I'm sorry, but no comment. Well, you can't blame me for asking, can you? No, I don't blame you at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm with you. <laughs> the jury was with Lansky. They acquitted him of taking money from Vinnie Teresa. A third indictment for skimming in Las Vegas was withdrawn. Lansky was too old and sick to stand trial. And in 1974, his conviction for contempt of court was overturned. Meyer Lansky had beaten the law. On the streets of heavily Jewish Miami Beach, Lansky became an elder statesman, a living legend. The most pious Jews in the world in Miami Beach were the holiest people to whom God is everything. Even God wasn't close to Meyer Lansky. As soon as they saw Meyer Lansky, forget about God, this was God. They used to worship him, follow him, look at him. If he walked down the street, they would talk about how slow he walked, how fast. Did he have a dog, a cow, a horse? Did he sit down, get up, what time? One time we were in this little deli down in Miami Beach, and these two young boys came up with yarmulkes on, and they were kind of looking at my grandpa, and I was kind of standing in the background, and they came up and said, Mr. Lansky, we'd, uh, we'd like to get your autograph. And he kind of looks at him seriously, and oh, my grandpa, he goes, well, what did I do, an Academy Award? And I said, well, we figured it'd be worth some money someday, Mr. Lansky, and he said, no, son, I don't sign autographs. Since the 1960s, Lansky had claimed to be retired. Now, as far as the FBI could tell, he really was. With all the surveillance that he had on him, he didn't have even the facility to get involved anymore in, in skimming or any of the other sources of income that he had. And that was, I suppose, the ultimate curse of him living so long, that he um, outlived his money and had no further way of earning any more. In 1982, Lansky turned 80. He had developed lung cancer. Joe Varon, his attorney and lifelong friend, pulled a few strings and arranged to restore Lansky's voting rights, lost since his felony conviction in 1950. And I gave it to him for a birthday present. He said, Joe, that's the best birthday present I ever got in my life. Meyer Lansky died on November 15, 1982. There were almost as many reporters at his funeral as there were mourners. When Lansky died, I don't think he had $300,000 to his name. And that sounds like a lot of money, but it was a mere pittance to a man that made millions. It was still widely believed that Lansky had millions tucked away somewhere, a Swiss bank account perhaps, but the money never turned up. Meyer Lansky outlived just about every one of his cronies from the heyday of the New York mob. And he did it the old-fashioned way. He kept his mouth shut. Even when he talked, Lansky never gave himself away or gave away any of his partners. Very, very careful, very, uh, and, and, and very smart. Throughout Lansky's career, if you take him way back from the beginning, he was always two, three steps ahead of everybody else. Yeah, he liked having an edge, and I think he liked having an edge, especially on people that were legitimate that he was trying to get over on. So, <laughs> you know, uh, gave him pleasure. He was a very civilized and a very businesslike individual. Uh, it might sound like heresy, but you could like Meyer Lansky. But though he always said that he never killed a man and was proud of that, this distinction he was making was basically false because the gangster actually lives more on the threat of violence than on violence itself. And all through his life, right to the end of his life, Lansky, with his hard look, delighted in scaring people and knew what the threat was behind that look that he gave.